five minutes. He was like, oh, you should know this. Oh, like, here's a base rule. Yeah, you should know this. Oh, wait, what's your 17 today? <laughs> oh, I can't uh, yeah, around nine. I said the two. I think this is 17 and a half. No, it's 15. So this is 17. Who went through all of our classes? I didn't get the notes photocopied, though, so you're going to have to wait. Oh, uh, my God. Today for those. Uh, I will have a practice exam um, on um, Thursday. Thursday. I think. Well, Thursday. I hope Thursday. Was there a test? It's uh, two weeks from today. Test two is November 7th. Take home? No, it's in class. No. <laughs> Hope it's not take home. <laughs> See? So lovely. You don't, you don't want his take home. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't get a practice test if it's a take home test. Okay. Hmm. Usually. So. Why don't we get into, um, oh, I was going to change some of the, the stuff. Oh, okay. okay. So, so homework number eight, somehow I got way late in my office before I got here. Um, I'm going to revise it just a little bit. Uh, again, I'm making one of the problems extra credit and changing the grad problem to a different problem, yes. I think. Unless I already had it changed. Let's see. No, number 20 was grad. I think one of the problems is making extra credit. That's all. So chapter five. Turns out a hard problem for you at this level. Six extra credit. Otherwise, the problems are the same. Twenty is still a grad problem. What? And twenty-two. And the answer to twenty, that you need, need also number twenty-two. So the twenty is a grad problem, but the answer to it, and the answer that you need also for problem number twenty-two is in problem number twenty-one B. Yeah, the formula. The answer is well, the formula for the variance of i hat of f, okay, equals. Let's write it down. Equals integral one equals one over n i of f squared minus i of f quantity squared. Okay, shown in number twenty one b. For a equals to zero, b equals to one, g equals to one. Okay. So that's what you're. The graduate students are supposed to derive this formula, the variance of a certain, of just a Monte Carlo, a Monte Carlo estimation of an integral. It's a very simple thing. Okay. Monte Carlo estimation of an integral. Okay. I mean, it's a very simple program to run. Problem 19. It's just a one do loop. Okay, to calculate. A, we uh, we have to do a program. It's uh -huh. one do loop. It's like one <laughs> line. And you're a computer science major or no. a previous computer science major. Give me a break. I'm not. This is even for I me. Have, I could look. <laughs> I've never done anything for computer N science. Equals one to blah do this and then end. Okay, it was that simple. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's that easy. I'll give you the program in class if you're having trouble. Okay, yeah. it's that easy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, is this due this Thursday? No, it's due on Tuesday. Tuesday. Due uh, Halloween, October 31st. Okay. They're all due Tuesday. Food, yeah. Right? Now I can totally change it again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We pretty much changed the homework to Tuesday. Now, so we 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 lost a day somewhere. Okay. That's okay. Um, so this, I'll put this information on the website too, but this formula, I may only refer to problem number 21B. This is, um, we can talk about it on Thursday. Okay, so that's the homework due, and I'll give you a review test next time. Okay. Um, have a cookie or something for one here. Just about this homework, apparently not, right? That was okay. 
All right. What's about the law of large numbers? Let's get into that. Chapter 5. Well, we'll see this. We'll see this Monte Carlo integral. I got a question. For the final, is it cumulative? No, it's not cumulative. Is it two and a half hour test yeah. though? Oh, you get two and a half hours. It may be a little bit, you know, maybe a little <laughs> bit longer. Maybe a little bit longer because it's going to be, you know, two chapters, six and seven. <laughs> You know, just, just give a little opportunity for a little bit longer. But I think it's still only 25 percent. Still only 25 percent debate. Same scale exams. 25, 25, 25, 25. Okay. 25 for homework, and they all and. So and, you should make it an hour in the exam. Yeah, no 75 more. minutes. You know, yeah. 90 minutes. Yeah, I don't want to be here longer than you. Okay. Even longer That's than you do. Last time okay. you said that, it actually took us all two and a half hours. Okay. Well, Everybody be was there two and a half hours. <laughs> oh. <okay. laughs> I don't remember that course. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. But well, that was in Dallas. <laughs> oh, yeah, that. Okay. You can get take home? <laughs> no, no. Well, I could probably now. We're safe. No. Take, take uh, home, but no. No. Most people don't want that. Safe. Safe. Okay. Um, I can make it for you take home, Chase. <laughs> that would be right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what are we going to do? We want to mathematically formulate the idea that if we average independent observations from a random variable, independent, then uh, we should obtain the mean. Remember, that's how we kind of discussed the mean. So I said, okay, I'm going to look at uh, a random variable. How, how do I discuss the mean of a random variable, right? So I, I took a random variable, I took something like um, um, <coughs> I took a, a, a discrete random variable x and I took a frequency function p of x, something kind of simple, uh, maybe negative 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, and I put uh, probability uh, 1 to 4 on each of these, something simple like that. Okay. And then, how did we figure out, how did we motivate the meaning of this random variable? Some, uh, yeah, you say, okay, what, what we did though is that we to motivate the mean, we thought of the mean, we think of the mean as minus one. If, if you think a bunch of, uh, a sequence of values chosen independently from this variable, just a sequence of numbers, where all the numbers are minus one, zero, one, or two. So we thought of two, uh, 1, 2, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay, and we added them, right? Okay, and then divided by the total number of observations, right? The number of observations. We said that should be approximate, and then we said, well, that should be approximately okay, approximately equal to one quarter of the number should be minus one, one quarter of the number should be zero, one quarter of the number should be one, one quarter of the number should be two. So we're going fourth times minus one plus one fourth times zero plus one fourth times one plus one fourth times two. Okay? Which is what the mean is. Equals mu. Which is what? Um, okay. Alright? So what we want to do is mathematically formulate uh, this should be. Okay? When I have a theorem for, for saying what's actually going I thought we did that. Uh, we did. Maybe we talked a little bit about the weak law of large numbers. I don't think so, though. Well, you know, we never did make make a mathematical theorem. So oh, if, I, if I do this average, then this converges to the mean. Remember, I said if you graphed it, if the function, if the random variable had a mean, uh -huh. and we then we would graph it. And if we took, if we took, uh, if we took, looked at the following, if we took the 
Xn equals x1 plus the so on plus Xn divided by n, where x1 through Xn are simulated values independent observations from the random variable, then you would get uh, something that, some kind of graph that went like this, it would smooth out going to be a cross, it shouldn't go to minus one half, it should go to one half, but this is one half. Maybe you get some situation at the beginning, this is two up here, and um, uh, you can't do exactly that, you could do something close to going to two, whatever. And you get some big fluctuations, but in the end you get some graph like this, this is a function of n. Okay? Yes, we argue you would get something like that if the mean exists, and even showed an example in the book where if the mean didn't exist, um, then uh, you wouldn't get convergence. Okay. There was a picture of the Cauchy distribution, of Cauchy distribution um, at the beginning of chapter four. I'll remind you of that, where they showed a couple examples like that. That was one of my favorite pictures. From Okay. On page 120, where they show um, averages from uh, a normal variable that had a mean and averages from a Cauchy variable that didn't have a mean. And you get totally different graphs. Okay. See that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Page 120 of the test. Okay? So that was not a theorem, though. That was just uh, numerical evidence. Oh. Okay. So I want to math formulate mathematically what we mean by the law of large numbers. This convergence. Okay? So this should be, in other words, convergence as n goes to infinity. So we are going to go ahead and look at, and this, uh, actually I shouldn't call this SN, we're going to call this XN bar. That's what we're going to call it. That's going to be the sample mean. So SN would have been a reasonable expression earlier. Okay. Sample mean. So there's an extra bar over the top. There's a capital X with a bar over it. And then a sub N to indicate how many observations were averaged. What do you mean by log large number? Well, we'll see that. The law, the law of large numbers is there's a many nar many numbers here, many number of observations. Okay. The law is that when I average all those numbers, the many observations, I get the mean. That's the law of large numbers. Oh. Then there's various senses in which I get the mean. Okay. Where so we're going to assume that x1, x2 through x and it can keep going, okay, are independent and each distributed according to uh, to the same distribution. Which we may name sometime. Uh, same distribution function, capital F of X, that has that we assume has a mean. Okay. Okay. And put mu, assume mu equals um, expected value. X1, which is the expected value of this distribution, okay, it exists. <coughs> so all the means of each of these X's is the same. Okay. And I already put this and put this thing. This is the sample mean. Okay? So I define this. And you find the sample mean. So what we're saying, the law of large numbers, is telling me that that sample mean should be about mu. In what sense, though? Okay. One and one version of it is just saying that the probability that the sample mean is far from is just even a little bit away from mu. It goes to zero. Yeah. Um, okay. So is this 
like the expected values of the whole bunch of x's? Like, you know, you have your little x and you have your large x to Okay, show the these are my capital x and my rent variables. These are all capital x's. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is a rent So variable. they each have their own means. Each x is an independent variable, yeah. So they each have their own means. So they actually, um, so when, I, when, I actually pay, when I actually simulate, all right, I just get one value from x1, one value from x2, one value from xn, and so on. So I just oh, get okay. one, that's what I get. So then if I, that would give me a sequence of numbers, okay? Then I have to re-simulate, all right? So that would give me one value of xn bar, and then I'd have to re-simulate to get a new value of x1, a new value of x2, a new value of xn, and then I'd get another value of the sample mean. So it's necessarily, it's not necessarily a mean of means? Right. What is that? Uh, well, it's not a mean of means. This is an average of random variables. Yeah. yeah. So, what? So are these x bar min or x min? What? What is x bar? Because you have x bar up there. Right? Yeah, this is a bar. Okay. I know it's confusing because the bar is the only thing that distinguishes it from this thing. Okay. This xn here. So that's kind of a crappy notation. Um, but it is the one that's used in the book, I believe. Um, on theorem A at the bottom of page 177 at the beginning of chapter 5. Well, I guess what I'm really asking is do the do each of the x's have their own different probability functions? And yeah, no, no, they have all have the same, they all have the same probability. Functions. Oh, okay. Okay, yes, I got that. So they're independent, identically distributed, so-called IID sequence. Independent, identically distributed, or identical. So these x ones are just like from a random number generator or something. Yeah, you can think of it as that. You can think of basically or a function of a random number generator. Random number generator generate a number uniform between zero and one, right? Uh -huh. Then x one would be some function of that that makes it have the right distribution. Yeah. Okay. So then I just I just generate them from a random number generator. And then exactly. you just add them up and divide by a number of iterations. Yeah, and give you one value of X and bar, uh -huh. okay. But then that's a random variable, so I'd have to do that simulation again to get another value. If I wanted a histogram, for example, for this one, I'd have to simulate many times. I have to simulate the, the sequence of size n over and over and over again, so I get many values for this one. Otherwise, I won't know how it's distributed. You give it, you know, it'll have a variability and everything. Okay. We argued once upon it. Now, what is the now? Part of this is that what is the variance of x n bar? We know that now, right? What's the variance of x n bar? What's the mean and variance of x n bar? Well, it's a random variable, right? So it has a theoretical mean. If I did this simulation, well, right? If I did this, sim it has a mean. This is a random variable. I thought that's a mean. No, it's an average. A random variable. These are in random variables. Is it average mean? Oh, well, a mean? Well, <laughs> over here, yeah, from the, from yeah, it is a mean. But you're thinking too elementarily. Uh, you're thinking too primitively. You have to think about um, about this being a random variable. This is a random variable. Okay, then it's fine here. Okay. If I, did, if I took x plus y divided by 2, that's a random variable, right? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. He said, now I'm taking x plus y plus z plus w divided by 4. All right, so this, if, the, if the notation is confusing you, that's what you do. So you, all right? Okay. So I'm taking a joint density. If I took the joint density of x and y, the joint density of x and y is going to be f of x of x times well, it's just going to be some f of x times f of y, <coughs> the same density, okay? All right? And so then, um, 
okay, so maybe I'll put XYZ, you know, the joint density of XYZ is going to be FX and Y F of Z. And then I'm going to look at X bar, it's simply going to be X plus Y plus Z divided by 3, okay? And what's the mean and variance of that thing, okay? I have to calculate it using this joint density, it's the multiple integral, right? So the mean of X bar would be equal to X plus Y plus Z divided by 3, triple integral, okay, FX, FY, FZ. There's one density, one probability function, right? DZ, DY, DX. One probability function the same, but it's product because there was to be independence, okay? Now, how would I actually calculate that? Can't you just multiply all the e um, expected well, this, values yeah. of Well, this is a, okay. It's one third of the expected values of each. Multiply yeah. together. Yeah. Multiply together. Now, there's a joint density splits as a product, but uh, I'm not getting. I don't, what? Have, I don't have a product function here. This is sum. Right? I don't have a product oh, function. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. expectation for sum is sum of expectations. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So if I just took the x apart, let's just bring it to this part. See if we're on the same page. I'm kind of sleepy this morning. Okay. <laughs> if I took if I took this broken into a sum, okay, then and I integrate the, then I have x with the fx, fy, fz. Well, the fy and fz just go out. They'll integrate the one, right? All right. So then you just get f of x times x divided by three. So you get the mean of x divided by three. The mean of x is the same as the mean of y is the same as the mean of z because they all have the same density. Okay? So it's just, this is the expectation of x1 plus and so on plus xn that I can divide by n, okay, like that, and that's just simply n mu over n equals mu. So the mean of xn bar is the same as the mean of all the other ones. But it doesn't have density f. xn bar does not have this density. Right? This density. Yeah, xn bar does not have this density of little f, which is the common density, common probability function of all the other x's. Okay? Is that normal? It'll be close to a normal density, yeah. Well, essential limit theory that, we have, that we're about to discuss this week. Okay. So this density might be even exponential, okay? Which is heavily skewed, but this, the distribution of xn bar is going to be uh, more symmetric. Okay, now what's this variability? What's the variance of x n bar? Remember how to do that? It's a variance of sum of independent. You had all these covariance calculations and whatnot. You're going to have to remember that good stuff. Okay? But the covariance is at zero between x and y, and the covariance between x and z is zero. The covariance between y and z is zero because they're independent. Okay? So if I wanted to calculate the, the variance of x plus y plus z divided by 3, okay, recall how to do that? Yeah. You would have covariances with everything and everything else, okay? It'd be nine terms, okay? Whatever. But I can just, uh, if you want to go back to basics, okay? Because I have x with x, x with y, x with z, okay, y with x, y with y, y with z, z with x, z with y, z with z, that's nine terms, okay? Mm -hmm. But all the covariances, that's expanded in terms of covariances, covariance of x with x, covariance of x with y, covariance of x with z, and so on. <coughs> but the covariance of x with y, all six of those terms are all zero, right? So you get covariance of x with x, covariance of y with y, covariance of z with z. Those are the variance of x, variance of y, variance of z. Uh, and also they have these factors of three uh, squared on all those. Mm -hmm. Covariance of one third x, one third y. All right. So this x you get one ninth coming up. So you get one ninth times the variance of x plus the variance of y plus the variance of z. We're going to assume that the variance uh, also exists. Assume e will be equal to one. Assume also that e that uh, sigma squared equals the variance of x one also exists. Okay. So we have a second moment. 
So this comes out, in general, then, what does it come out to be? Okay, this comes out to be 3 ninths times sigma squared, therefore. And what does it come out in general? Variance of x and bar, you get n. You get 1 over n squared, which you get n sigma squared for the n variance terms. Okay? So here we get sigma squared over n. So the variance of x n bar is small as n gets large. So that means it's going to be like a really big peak or something. Covariance x y equals covariance x z equals covariance y z equals zero. So yeah, so uh, the, the, the probability function of the sample average, the sample mean, is going to have is going to be peaked, right? So if n goes to infinity, basically you're saying it's like a delta function. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Finally. Good. Oh. Let's see. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. So here's me. All right. Here is something that looks like this. Okay, <laughs> okay. For the density of x and bar. Okay, so apparently that's what's happening. Okay. At least this variance is small. Okay? Apparently. This is expect expected. Okay. Anyway, intuitively, it looks like this. Okay? And how symmetric it would be, and so on, is sort of up for grabs at this point still. But the, the laws of large numbers say the following. So the weak law of large numbers is this. We're going to have basically some definitions of behavior, of general behavior of random variables. And that is that the probability that xn bar minus mu greater than epsilon, okay, for every epsilon greater than zero, this probability goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So that's one way of stating that the sample mean goes to mu. Okay? This be weak law. This is called a weak law of large numbers. Okay? This is uh, it's going to be a weak law and a strong law. These are just definitions. We're not going to prove the strong law. We can prove the weak law under these assumptions. Okay. So usually, it's stated first because it's the most easiest one to uh, state and to prove. Okay. So this is saying that there's not much probability of mass associated to values, you know, mu plus epsilon. Minus epsilon. So this is making this picture a little bit more precise. If I take, for any epsilon, if I take the interval uh, mu minus epsilon and mu plus epsilon, then almost all the probability mass is in there. Okay? So that's the same thing as saying the probability of x bar is approaches probability of mu, or mu, right? So. As n gets bigger, We're saying actually the definition is that x n bar goes to mu goes in probability. To mu. Okay. So we say that x n bar goes to mu in probability. It's what the what the what this definite is the definition. Okay? Of this thing. And for every epsilon greater than zero, the difference. Bigger than mu goes to zero in probability. Okay, with probability. Like that. Okay? Does that just mean that, um, like, if we didn't worry about probability, does that mean that x bar n just goes to mu, or does it have to be the probability of those? What does it mean? Does x n bar go to mu? Well, um, Took, if you took your your simulation, okay, and you calculate xn bar, is it going to go to mu or could it go to somewhere else? Um, Probably go to mu. Because <laughs> it's all identical. And... Yeah. Um, 
Well, that was under the assumption that the mean exists and all that stuff. Okay. What there could be is there could be some kind of counterexample type, counterexample type behavior that we have to investigate, and we're not going to do that in this course. I'm going to give various levels. This is called weak law. Okay. If if uh, you have a sequence of random variables, you know you don't have to have x n bar, but let's see, it was just a sequence of random variables. C n. Okay, that's somehow you got from somewhere. We don't know where. Okay? Sort of an abstract setting. Then Zn goes to view and probability. If when I replace this xn bar by Zn, then I get Zn minus mu greater than epsilon, that goes to zero. Okay? Does that mean that that if I that somehow if I took and I took an actual sequence of Zn's that they actually go to mu? That That's a different statement. The same it's a different statement is saying that the probability that, that uh, the, the random variable is just a little ways away from you is going to zero. Okay, is that goes to infinity? Does that mean it's actually going to merge every time? It wouldn't necessarily mean that. That would convert to the probability of one. Okay. So why is this called a weak law? What makes it weak? Uh, in reference, with, with uh, regard to the strong law, this is because then we have a strong law. This is two law of large numbers are going to stay, one weak and one strong. The strong implies the weak. It's a terminology in mathematics that one property is strong, one property is weak. The strong property always implies the weak property, but you may have the cost of more assumptions. Okay. I'm going to get the strong law applying in general. But here, um, actually, um, okay. so there may be independence assumptions, for example. Here we're assuming independence of the random variables and so on. Okay. We maybe we'll get a weak law without independence. Okay. So it's just a weak law is a statement. Okay, but under the independence assumption, a strong law implies the weak law. Okay. So it's getting a little technical. Okay, because the author is going to say, I'm going to actually give you the theorems that are usually stated in the classical textbooks. All right. There it is. There's a mathematical formulation of law of large numbers. That's formulation one. Formulation two, and well, speed, how do you prove that, by the way? Under these assumptions, where you assume the variance exists. There's a bunch of assumptions. You have independent identically distributed, you're assuming the mean of the variance. What does it mean by identically? They all have the same probability function. Oh. Okay. And I have I wrote down the distribution function rather than a density function. Because the distribution function is more general. Okay. Because I'm not assuming continuous random variables, the distribution random variables are anything. It could be a mixed kind of variable. Okay? How would you prove the weak law of large numbers? It looks a lot like Chebyshev's. Yeah, it's Chebyshev. Okay? The probability that xn bar minus mu could be the epsilon, I can estimate that, is just the probability that xn bar minus mu squared could be the epsilon squared. See, so, you now how do we do that? Oh, yeah, this is okay, Chebyshev. We had, we had a rule for this. This is uh, less than or equal to what? Let's see. There's various versions of Chevy Chess rule. How did we do it? Um, K sigma or somewhere? Oh, uh, yeah, usually I guess we wrote it this way. Okay, so what we needed to do was set up with uh, the, the standard deviation of this. I think the easiest way, though, is this. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm going to rederive Chevy Chess inequality essentially. This is going to, I'm gonna just going to rederive Chevy Chess inequality because it's easier than trying to set it up in the Chevy Chess law. Okay. Now, what you said, you always have that the problem, the Markov inequality we also had. This is always less than or equal to the expected value of x n bar minus mu squared divided by epsilon squared. That's the Markov inequality. If y is greater than or equal to zero, then the probability that y is bigger than m is less than e y divided by m. That's because. Um, That's quite elementary because um, the 
multiply both sides by m, then I have m times the probability of y is bigger than m, well, that's certainly less than the, the, the tail of the formula for the expectation of, of, of y. As you have y, you have m times probably y is about m plus a little bit bigger m times probably y is about that little bit bigger value and so on and so forth. So if I just take this m times probably y is bigger than m, that m is smaller than all the other values of y, y bigger than m. So m times probably y is bigger than m is less than to the total sum, right? If I integrate uh, x times the probability that x is with a y, if I multiply y times the probability that y is in y to y from dy, okay, from m to infinity, that's less. That's uh, less. That's the expect. That's less than the expectation already. Uh, you guys are wanting to go from m to infinity, okay? But now if I replace this y by m, which is a lower number, then that's even smaller, okay? Less than to this integral, okay? And that's what I'm saying. This is m times the probability that y is bigger than m. basically calculates the mean if m is equal to zero, okay? Because I assume that I had a non-negative random variable. If m is equal to zero, then I get the mean. This is the mean, okay? All right, so if I go from m a little bit bigger than zero, so, so we'll let it for m greater than zero here, I'm assuming m is positive, okay? So if m is bigger than zero, then this is less than or equal to the mean. Yeah. Now I pull this, this y out, the smallest possible value is m. Again, I pull that out, and so I get a number that's even smaller, okay? But this integral is just the probability that y is bigger than m, okay? Because I'm just summing up the probabilities of y is in y to y plus dy from m to infinity. So that's just the probability that y is bigger than m. So I get this. This is a mark of any All right? I think we mentioned it once upon a time when we did check the chess code, okay? So now what is this expectation? Here I'm applying with m equals epsilon squared, okay? What, what is this expectation? This expectation is the variance of xn bar. So this is sigma squared over n divided by epsilon squared, okay? So even though epsilon is small, n is going to infinity first, then, then epsilon is going to zero, okay? So I'm fixing epsilon, let n go to infinity. So this is sigma squared over n epsilon squared, all right? So that goes to zero as, up, as n goes to infinity. So that's the proof. And, um, so if epsilon is very small, then um, the function of n that I don't get, I don't necessarily get this thing going to zero. Okay? If epsilon was 1 by the square root of n, then I just simply get sigma square root over 1 here. Okay? <coughs> I wouldn't need something going to zero. They can't let epsilon go to zero at the same time that n goes to infinity necessarily. No, okay. but, but isn't the whole point of it that epsilon is it's fixed. approaching zero? Oh, oh yeah, it's fixed. fixed. For each epsilon greater than zero, this okay. goes to zero. So in other words, all the probability mass for each epsilon greater than zero, all the probability mass is squeezed in here. Okay? So eventually, all the probability mass has to be between mu minus 0.01 and mu plus 0.01. Oh, okay. It has so we're to be fixing this. epsilon, even yeah. if it's like really, yeah. really small. But even if like the bottom is one, then the sigma squared is still going to like zero. How do you know? Like, no, no. Right. Sigma squared is fixed because it's, the, it's the variance of the constant, the common probability function. Oh, okay. How do you fix? Epsilon, because doesn't epsilon change as n gets bigger? No, not in this problem. Epsilon is fixed for every epsilon greater. This is a statement of convergence and probability. All right, that's just a mathematical formulation. That's that's a definition. We verified that this is, this condition holds under these hypotheses. Okay. Mathematics saying I'm done. Okay. <laughs>
Now. Because <laughs> I always think this goes to infinity because if epsilon gets smaller, and then since it's I'm fixing squared, epsilon, I'm fixing epsilon, okay, and I'm getting this probability goes to zero. So that it, indeed, if you give me an interval, then all the probability of mass of x n bar, and your simulation is going to have all your values that are x n bar are going to be between mu minus epsilon mu plus epsilon eventually. Okay, for large n. Okay. Does that mean you're getting convergence? I was saying that the probability, the pro with, you know, with uh, overwhelming probability, all the values are between that. Okay. Well, we can say they all work. Okay. So there's a little bit of this is going to zero. There's a little bit of the stuff that might get away. Okay. The one that got away, okay? Some of the values, they don't all have to be mu minus epsilon mu plus epsilon for n large, okay? Yeah, I mean, I was just saying that the the probability of mass of x n bar is going to be between mu minus epsilon mu plus epsilon and 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 mu so then there's the law of large numbers, strong law of large numbers. Okay. And that is that indeed, with probability 1, xn bar goes to mu. On page 2, it notes number 14. Uh, I'm not going to go through the example there. We're going to talk about the strong law. Okay. Um, Strong law of large numbers is that xn bar minus mu is bigger than for every epsilon greater than zero. Uh, xn bar minus mu is greater than epsilon for only finitely many, many n. This is a way to relate them, the two, with probability of one. So in other words, there's only, um, so this cell tells you that eventually, yes, that eventually, so there is a set with probability of one, assuming you're not on the exceptional set that has probability of zero. In other words, your simulation, assuming your simulation doesn't somehow uh, belong to an exceptional set with probability of zero, okay? You have to, that's always that. Is that? Caveat. So with probability one, assuming your simulation is in this set of probability one, okay? What does that mean? That means that the sequence you get is, okay, the probability space consists of infinite sequences. Greater than? Okay. Yeah, it only happens for only finally met many n with probability one. Okay, in other words, eventually, i.e. eventually, xn bar minus mu is less than or equal to epsilon, okay, for every epsilon greater than zero, all right, which means that xn bar goes to mu, i.e. xn bar goes to mu, as n goes to infinity. That's the definition of convergence. If for every epsilon greater than zero, the sequence um, is only finally in the end for which this is bigger, Eventually, yeah. it's less than or equal to for every epsilon. It means converges. Uh, well, I still don't understand the part that says with probability one. So with probability, there's, this, there's okay. There's a probability space. This gets technical. There's a probability space, capital omega, which has little omegas in it. Okay, little omega in our problem is going to be an actual sequence. Uh, you can think of it as is is an infinite sequence. Okay, of where each omega, let's say, is a number between zero and one. Okay, from your just your um, your random uniform random variables, independent uniform random variables. Okay, so then and then so this is probability space is constructed. Okay, it's infinite sequences like that. Okay, then we can talk about subsets of this probability space having certain probability. 
okay? And we're saying that there's a subset with probability of one, okay? So there's only, well, we think it was a few sequences left out of that set, okay? Such that this property holds. But there might be an exceptional sequence. Like your simulation might depend on one of these exceptional sequences, and you might not get convergence, okay? But that's with probability zero. So we say, oh, that doesn't happen. Okay. Because if it kind of did happen, then like your distribution function would be. Like, well, if it kind of did happen, is you were extremely, extremely unlucky. It's like one in, you know, it never happens, right? Probability zero doesn't happen. Okay. But it still happens in terms of the actual sequences in your set. Can have there is an infinite set of sequences that can have probability zero. Okay. The first part of it does that mean? Um, It'd be like if you were picking numbers at random, and every number you picked was a rational number, okay? Mm -hmm. That's possible, right? No. All right. Well, mathematically it's possible, but practically it's impossible, okay? In other words, the, sequence, the set of all sequences of just only rational numbers has probability zero, mm -hmm. okay? Or is it probably approaching zero? Or is well, no, if, you if every, every number in your infinite sequence had okay. be a rational number, that has probability zero. Yeah. Okay. It's not, you, in other words, there's no counterexample. All right? Every single one, is, or at least infinitely many. Is the first one kind of like you're um, fixing um, n and n minus 1 for n minus 1? Yeah. Kind of like that? Or is it no, for every epsilon, I'm saying that this, this does, this, eventually, Happens. you do. All the numbers are in between mu minus epsilon and plus epsilon. Uh -huh. Okay, period. Okay, if you go out far enough. There's only finitely many exceptions. Okay? And so this is with probability one. So indeed, then, there aren't, none of the fish got out of the net. Okay? Because when so if you take this mu minus epsilon, mu plus epsilon, all the xn bars are in there. Okay? In your simulation, period. Okay? For every f sign greater than zero, where the n has to be in epsilon, obviously, with a cutoff. But it's greater than epsilon, so it's it says only for only finally met. Oh, okay. So I'm trying to point out the difference between these two things. Here we said xn bar minus mu bigger than epsilon has a certain small probability. Mm -hmm. Okay? Here we're saying that when n is big enough, this event doesn't happen at all. Mm -hmm. Okay? Oh, this is because we run out of exceptional finite things, or? Yeah, this just means that you get actually convergence. X n bar goes to me. It's just a restatement of convergence. The author put it, stated it this way. It's very confusing if you haven't had analysis recently. So you don't know what the definition of convergence is. For every epsilon greater than zero, then eventually X n bar minus two is less than epsilon, as n goes to infinity. Okay? But there's a number of capital n, so that little n is bigger than capital n, and this is true. That means there's only finitely many exceptions. That's equivalent to saying there's only finitely many exceptional n. I'm thinking about exceptional n. I'm using exceptions in two different ways. One, exceptional sequences. Okay. The other one, exceptional n. Okay? Okay. All right. So here, there's only finitely many exceptional n where xn bar minus mu is outside the interval mu minus, to where xn bar is outside the interval mu minus epsilon and mu plus epsilon. So physically, what's happening? You got mu, you got mu plus epsilon, you got mu minus epsilon, except for a very exceptional set of, of simulations with a probability zero, okay? Which will never happen, okay? On your computer, unless you force it to happen by, you know, saying you will come up rational, okay? <laughs> Which actually would happen because the third round never generated. <laughs> Forget about that, okay? Um, that. Okay, that you might have so your xn bars might look like this, but eventually they're always going to be in there. Okay? Okay. All right. And when they start going in there, it depends on, you know, how big epsilon is. All right? And then you make epsilon smaller. They'll still all be in there. Oh, eventually they'll all be in there. Always. Okay? That means you have convergence. xn bar goes to me. Can you have divergence? Or no? This is a theorem. Under those hypotheses. Oh. IID with mean mu, actually, you don't even need the variance. Oh. If only the mean exists, okay, then this is true. Oh. Then this automatically gives the 
weak law of large numbers by this formulation. Okay? Are you gonna use that? No. No. Now that's more way more advanced. Okay. It looks pretty yeah, obvious. Yeah, 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 in a PhD level course. It well, looks like pretty obvious. Well, it's still under these conditions, it's not that easy. This is called almost sure convergence. Because with probability of one, you get convergence. Okay? I'm almost sure. sure. I isn't like absolutely sure. Right, because of this sequence, exceptional sign. Oh, okay. In other words, not every simulation in the universe does not give convergence. Okay? Oh. Necessarily. Just 100% oh, of them, oh. not all of them. It's 100% of It's 100% yeah, but not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, if it's a law, that means it's always sure. Not almost sure. Almost sure means there's an exceptional set of probability zero, in which it doesn't necessarily have to hold. <laughs> so there, are, there can be infinite sets of probability zero. We just talked about them. All rational sequence. A sequence is purely rational. Okay? <laughs> that is. Is, is physically possible in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in the infinite fine. universe. In the infinite universe it is. <laughs> Not in our finite universe, but in the infinite universe it is possible. Okay? Okay. Let's skip those things. Those are the, those are the things that blow people's mind a little bit. But this is the best we can do, mathematical formulation. Okay? Of, the, of this business. If we throw away those exceptional sets, then I'm done. So is the proof pretty hard? Yeah, it would be with probability one. Yeah, that's kind of hard. I'm just wondering, because you say we don't use the variance for this, but in order to prove the um, weak theorem, you use the variance. So I'm wondering if you use the variance to prove that one. No, you right? don't. That's what you got to do. you got to get away without using the variance. You can, yeah. you can prove a version that does use the variance. Okay. okay or more is that why it's called a so you Normally what you do is you do a truncation technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. You truncate the random variables so that they do have a variance. Cut them off. So why do you call it a strong? And then you worry about what happened, you know, with those large varieties. You, you worry about various cases then. You do a truncation technique. Okay, so somehow you get it together, but I don't remember exactly how the proof goes anymore. Okay. It's been so many years now. We haven't taught this probability, the advanced probability class, of course, ever here. Since I've been here in the last 20 years. <laughs> uh, so it's been too long since I've looked at those proofs. Okay. Wow. I wonder exactly how it goes. Why don't we talk about the application? Application, Monte Carlo integration. This is the baby application, but it's kind of, it gets used all the time. Application, um, and that's the uh, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo is a plate, right? Isn't it? <laughs> some place in yeah, it's some in the Riviera or somewhere. Some gambling place somewhere, I think. It's capital of Monaco. Yeah. Not Monaco is a city. Monaco is a place, right? So this well, it's a principality or something. Yeah. It's, you know, some banker nation. Or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some <laughs> rich People are called Monegasques, so and you can't be one of them. You know. Yeah. Generations that are original. Okay. Monte Carlo integration. So it has something to do with gambling, but what you're going to do is if I want to integrate integrate um, g of x dx from 0 to 1, and I don't know how to do it, for example, integral cosine 2 pi x squared is going to be one of the examples in your homework from 0 to 1. Um, and I don't know how to do it, with, or maybe I didn't need an infinite series or something, but instead I just have my handy handy computer on hand and I can write one do loop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I will just compute it that way. All right. How would I do that? Well, this is, you can think of this as the mean, right? This is the mean. mean. That's the mean for. Um, this mean uh, as follows. It's the mean of a random variable. It's the integral 0, 1, g of 
x times f of x dx, okay, which is the mean of ram of, of g of equals the mean of g of x of g of x, okay. G of x as in you're using the same g of x. Yeah, uh, this g is the same as that g, where f of x here, or f of x identically equal to 1, right? Uh, is the density uh, so, of the uniform. So, yeah, yeah. Ah, that's Okay? Oh. Okay, so that's the mean parameter, so I'm just going to get it by applying uh, the law of large numbers. Right? Where x is a uniform variable. So x, the basic x, is x is uniform, 0, 1, right? So therefore, I'm just going to take um, x and I'm going to take that, uh, we're going to call this i hat of g, okay? Equals, therefore, um, g of x1 plus and so on plus g. I should maybe call these u's. I should call this g. Yeah, I should call this g of u d u. This, this will be better. If, if you don't mind erasing a bit, I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to change variables to u. It's e of g of capital u for f of u equals to 1, which is the density of uniform 0, 1. I'll call this capital u is uniform 0, 1. So is g of u1. So these are going to be my random variables, x and g of u n. So g of, g of u is my x, right? If you divide, divide by n. That's going to be what I'm going to apply my law of large numbers to x equals g of u. Alright? Expected value of g of u, right? I'm calculating u is expected value of g of u. So I have to apply the law of large numbers to x equals g of u. G of u, all right? So this is just my, or, yeah, so this, this is exactly how I was thinking of it. Some function applied to a uniform variable is my random variable, all right? So whatever that function is, the integrand is fixed there. Whatever it's integral a to b, then you have to rewrite this a little. Okay? I still want to set it up with a uniform random variable a to b. If it was a to b, then I'm going to have to do something a little bit different. Alright? Figure out different numbers. But let's just pretend about this one. I'd have to multiply and divide by b minus a or something. Right? If I integral a to b, g of uh, oh, okay. u du, then I would write this as, I have to write it in the density, a to b g of u times 1 over b minus a du, okay, so I put the b minus a out here, okay, now this was the mean of a random variable, okay? What's b minus a? b minus a, yeah, that's oh, the constant density. Multiply. multiply and divide by b minus a. So if I didn't have 0 to 1, if I had a to b, or a to b finite, I would, this is what is going to be my expected value, all right? So this is the expected value g of u, or u, u is, or u is uniform, on a, b, okay? And so, I, so this whole thing is equal to b minus a times that, okay? So, so therefore, I'm not going to be able to deal with uniforms if I go zero to infinity, okay? <laughs> so this is only going to be good for inter intervals over finite intervals. So I go ahead and I calculate, that's what I'm going to call i of g, and that's going to be, this goes to i of g equals mu, right? Where I call this i of g, the integral of g, okay? So instead of putting a bar, they put a hat this time. Okay, that's the Monte Carlo method. You just take an average, just do the simulation, and you take the average of the numbers, and that's your integral. Average of the what? 
How do you average it? Oh, oh okay. So you basically... <laughs> you take the average. So you do a do loop, right? 4 n equals 1 to new mix. Okay. Do <laughs> g do, do, do i equals i plus g of well, I need a random, I need u equals um, a random sample or something like that. I don't even know how to say it. Okay? Mm -hmm. Random something. Okay? I guess, and I, I, was, I was making it a, unit, a number between, I guess I did something like 10,000 or something like that. One's a random sample divided by 10,000, I guess. I guess there's another call in MATLAB to do that, right? To get a uniform number between 0 and 1. I don't know what it is. It's, I think it's just random. It's just random. Yeah, random. Maybe I did it wrong then. Random. I don't know how to do it. It depends on what package you have. What package. Anyway, u equals a random number between. Um, anyways, I forgot the syntax. I did forget to bring it with me. I think. What's the program here? That's a one syntax that works. Um, Rand sample, I think is what I did. I did Rand sample. This is this is the crude way to do it, or actually do it by hand. Rand sample. So if you just use Rand, then you probably get the, the number between zero and, and one. But here I get a number between one and ten thousand, and I divide it by ten thousand. Okay. To get a number between zero and one. Okay. Actually, if you just do Rand one times ten thousand. Okay. <laughs> I just need a uniform number. So I put this, okay? I plus G of U divided by units. Okay? Yeah. Or I equals zero to start, right? I equals zero to start. That N equals one, then N equals N plus one. And that's the end of your do loop. Okay? Okay, that's it. That's the whole program. Okay? And that was the integral? And then you end up with i at the end, then you compute i at the end. You just, i is the end. And then you compute pi, then i. Alright, i is the answer. Alright? What do we compute i? It's what it computes. Yeah, i gives you i, right? Yeah. i is i. That's so profound. Okay. This is, <laughs> <laughs> what you get is the i hat, right? What's <laughs> Which is just this average. All right, only it, this is divided by new mits. Uh, I'm sorry, you, yeah, because you're doing the new mits here. This is my new mits. Okay? <laughs> okay. New mits. I shouldn't have used n again. I should have used i or something like that. I should have just put, okay, i goes from 1 to 10. i goes from, I goes from 1 to 10. Can't use i. Can't use little i? No. Little i is defined by MATLAB. Yeah, you can use k. Thank you. All right, k equals k plus one. All right, this is a better this is a better program. Okay, so everybody, I think this is a valid program. Okay. J and I are. Put another semicolon here or something. Okay, that looks like a valid program. Okay. K goes from one to n. Do this. K plus k plus one to n, and then you calculate i at the end. All right. So you think you can deal with that? approximation, right? So then it gives you something. What the, the point of this is, and the author makes it kind of a nice point, is that numerical integration methods in calculus for a uh, function of a single variable are much better. Simpson's rule, trapezoid rule, even. Mm -hmm. They're even better than that. Simpson's rule way better than this. Okay, it's faster. But this is general and it works in higher dimensions. Higher. It doesn't matter how many dimensions you have. Yeah, you can have a function of 10,000 variables. What do you okay. mean where the geometry gets weird? Yeah. Trapezoid yeah. Stuff. What do you yeah. mean? Yeah, the geometry gets weird, you can just use this. Oh. Okay, or suppose I wanted to, well, another problem was, suppose I want to uh, have some weird shape shape or something in the plane or something like that, and I want to compute the area. How would I do that? Can't. Yeah, I could just uh, take points at random, okay, <laughs> and they fall in the shape. Then I count one, all right? If they don't, then I just take the number of percentage of points that fall in the shape. It's a little question on this. Why? 
How, how, how does it work? I just have it in weird shape. If, if you have a way of it, telling me whether the point light came inside the shape. Uh -huh. You get a 1. You get 1. Okay, so but if z uh -huh. equals 1 or 0 according to uh, x, y belongs to the object, okay, or 0 else, okay? Oh, okay. And then okay. use the percentage times some so sort of I, y square. I, so I, I take pairs x, i, y, i, which are uniformly distributed uh -huh. on the square. I call z, I, that's my random variable. Uh -huh. And then e, z is the area. I just take uh, z1 plus the sum plus zn divided by n. Take n, you know, I'll take m large, and that's going to be my, uh, area. my area. That's pretty cool. You never thought of it. So that's another application. More of large numbers. How do you use this for a multi dimension, as you said? Well, if you just had a very high dimensional thing, you just plug it in. How do you plug? Somehow have to take uniform. You have to be able so to basically, generate a bunch of uniform for well, both okay. dimensions. Well, okay. You don't have to think too much about putting things together. Simpsons really have you have to construct these parabolic approximations and blah blah blah. You don't have to do any of that. You just use a lot of large numbers. So I'm not going to get into detail about that. So you like have a boundary and you make the shape and the percentage of points. Yeah, I think that, I mean, this is just one, one small illustration. Um, the author didn't really give you much to go on there. She's saying that this is, it, it's just so general and it doesn't depend on anything. And then simulation probably has shown that it works well in higher dimensions, just as well as mm -hmm. any other program. So in higher dimensions, it's, it works without any depth. Things you try to come out make. There's a lot of watch numbers. I gave an example to try to show. Uh, I did some nasty examples in here where I actually tried to do some uh, analysis and actually showing um, if you average uh, a bunch of independent Poisson random variables, um, then you can actually calculate the probability of that uh, you're far away from the mean one. But the pulse on the mean one. I think I'm going to skip that. That's just a uh, hardcore calculation, which I probably don't want to look at. Um, if I wanted to estimate, um, now here's another question. So now, then we're going to get to the central limit here, for example. We want to get to the next thing. But x1, x2, we use above. Well, let's let them be, let x1, x2, and so on be independent uh, n0, 1 random variables. Take a very special case. So they each have the same distribution, it's all normal, with mean 0 variance 1. And then uh, the, what's the probability that xn bar minus 0 is bigger than epsilon? Okay? That goes to 0 for any fixed epsilon because that was the big law of large numbers. Okay, as n goes to infinity. So you fix epsilon at n goes to infinity, this probability goes to zero. So the mean is equal to zero? The mean, yeah, the mean of x1 is equal to zero. Yeah. That's what we assume. Mean zero. Okay. And then you said x1. Okay. Well, there's another weak Suppose we have, suppose now we replace, suppose we replace epsilon by t over the square of n, okay? So t over the square of n goes to zero. So we're gonna let epsilon go to zero at the same time we let n go to infinity. All right, then what do I get? Then the probability that xn bar minus zero is bigger than t over the square root of n. What's that equal to? Well, put my bar here, xn bar is normal, what's its variance? It's 1 over n. So that means the square root of n times xn bar is normal with variance 1.
this is exactly n01. Remember, if I a linear uh, function of a normal is again normal, this is n01 now. Okay? What? Ah. How does that n01? Okay. Xn bar has a density that looks like this. Okay. Yeah. Very small. Variance equals one over n. Right? Right. n deviation is one by the square root of n. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So I, I multiply by square root of n, spread this out to a standard norm. Spread the x values out. Get them away from the origin. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So you can okay, multiply by square root of n and squash that density function to be a standard normal. Yeah. So what's the variance of the square root of n times x n bar? It's square root of n squared times the variance of x n bar. Oh, okay. Okay, we're all sleepy today. Well, the square root of n squared is just taking one off times the variance of x n bar. Okay? Equals n times one over n equals one. The mean is still zero. Okay? Okay. So that's n zero one. So probably n zero one is bigger than t. That's uh, one minus phi of t times two. Or something like that. Where phi is this is the standard two. So the probability that a standard normal is bigger than t is okay. It's two tails in absolute. It's the absolute value is bigger than t. Calculate two tails, right? And so phi. I thought what? I am absolute. Oh, absolute. Because that was a left over from this absolute value from the weak law of large numbers, okay? So I'm saying that you don't get uh, zero anymore, okay? You get this number, where phi is the cumulative distribution function of the standard normal. You've seen that in your previous course. I know you saw that, okay? The capital P function. So the question is now, independent of n. This calls the question whether if we normalize the sample mean of a sequence of independently identically distributed random variables to mean zero and variance one, uh, do we also obtain the same result? So in other words, if I don't, if I don't take n01, but I take something else, like exponentials, do I get the same kind of result? The question is, if, if now, x1, xn have mean 0 and variance 1, and um, etc. and our otherwise I will be independent identically distributed, okay? And also I will be whatever as before. Okay, I take my IID sequence and we put Zn equals uh, square root of n times xn bar, okay? Uh, do we have the probability that Zn, the absolute value bigger than t, goes to 2 times 1 minus phi of t. There you actually have equality for the normal case. It's actually equal. Here I'm only asking for convergence as n goes to infinity. Is this true? So now Zn has mean 0 and variance 1 as before. Because that calculation has mean 0 and variance 1 doesn't depend on normality. Okay? Is mean the same as the original mean, which is mean 0? Okay? And variance 1 because I multiply by the square root of n. And this had variance 1 over it. Okay? So this is a random variable. And it doesn't have this nice symmetric distribution like a normal necessarily. But is it going to something that looks like a normal? Does it give you the normal probabilities in the limit? Does it, in other words, is Zn becoming standard normal in the limit? The answer is yes. If we assume, uh, I mean, these assumptions exactly, the answer is yes. You have to have a second moment so you have a variance. As long as they're IID and have variance, they're 
Then we really do get the shape. Okay. In other words, this is a delta function. You're saying, well, when I spread it out, it actually looks like standard normal. So you're forcing the variance to equal one instead of zero as it approaches. I'm uh, for to, to make this to make this to make the formulation simple. If I don't have variance 1, if I have mean mu and variance sigma squared, okay, then I have to take this and divide it by sigma, uh, and then I get the same answer. Okay? That has, still has mean 0 and variance. Well, that's the standard norm. This has mean 0 and variance 1. Well, what do you mean standard norm? Xn. Xn. This, nor this is the normalization procedure, but that's not a standard normal. Because x was not a normal distribution, okay, x one was exponential or whatever. Okay, so this is this is a skewed distribution. Okay, but it's becoming more and more symmetric. Okay, I have to subtract the mean divided by the standard deviation here, and then I get something with mean zero and variance one. Okay, and then I actually get a standard why do you, probabilities. Why do you minus mu and divide by sigma to make what I do is, if it has mean, mu, and variance sigma squared, I just subtract the mu and divide by the sigma. Then it has mean zero and variance one. Oh. On each of these x's. That partly is when I average, so just taking the mean away from the average and dividing the average by a sigma. Uh, okay. Okay. I just reduce to the previous case, in other words. You just fix it up, okay? I just made the easy assumption, mean zero variance one, you get this. And if, okay, if it's mean mu variance sigma squared, well, then this has mean zero variance one, okay? So you just make a linear transformation of the original variable, okay? All right, maybe we ought to call a quiz today. We'll do the central limit theorem next time. And, um, oh, I have some notes, but um, I'll have to copy them off next time. Mm -hmm. If you're really dying for some notes, I'll go copy them right now in my office.